great to be here. Uh, and it's it's uh, really great to see everybody. It's such an important and timely event. And I understand it's been a, a terrific and substantive and lively morning. And uh, I'm really glad to have the chance to join you today. It's a momentous time to work in the State Department on human rights and democracy issues. A challenging time, obviously, with the events uh, in Libya and Bahrain uh, over the last few days, but also the more hopeful signs that we see in Egypt and Tunisia. In each of these countries, years of human rights abuses have played an important role in fomenting revolution. And citizens have stood up to say that they're no longer willing to abide stolen elections, sham veneers of democracy, suppression of free speech, corruption, and violent deprivations of basic human rights. Human rights are now at the forefront of US foreign policy and global concerns. And those who question whether human rights really mattered in the Mideast now have their answer. It would be hard to overemphasize the importance of ensuring that a path towards stable, genuine democracies that can anchor the region and be an example for positive change worldwide move forward. The pace of change varies across the, across the Middle East. Some countries move forward, others are kept at a standstill. Iran stands out as a place where respect for fundamental human rights has deteriorated and where the aspirations of the people are being deliberately thwarted. Our effort over the coming weeks to secure a new UN Special Rapporteur in Iran represents this administration's most ambitious undertaking to date at the UN Human Rights Council uh, in Geneva. We're mounting this campaign on a foundation that we've built up over the last 18 months since joining the Council. Without that groundwork, this mandate would be out of reach, but even as it is, it will be difficult to get there. Each year at the UN General Assembly, three countries earn condemnation for their human rights records, Iran, Burma, and North Korea. Of these three, Iran is the only one that's not the subject of a standing UN mandate focused on its conduct. This glaring gap has existed since 2002, when the United States was for the first time voted off the UN Human Rights Council's predecessor body, the Commission on Human Rights. With the US gone, others moved to abolish the Iran mandate. We were absent, and they succeeded in voting it down by one vote. Nine years later, the United States has rejoined the UN human rights system, and we're working to bring this mandate back. UN action on Iran is particularly difficult, but also particularly important. Since 2000, the UN has seen a 50% increase in the number of thematic special rapporteurs covering issues like right to food, development, and freedom of expression, but seen a commensurate decline of more than 40% in the number of rapporteurs focused on individual countries. The Brookings Institution has said that this reflects, quote, the successful efforts by some states, particularly those with bad human rights records, to avoid the naming and shaming tactics associated with country-specific mandates. If successful, the current initiative on Iran will represent the first new country mandate established since the Human Rights Council was created in 2006. Make no mistake, Iran will go to extraordinary lengths to avoid this outcome. It takes the UN seriously, places many of its strongest diplomats in UN posts, and knows how to marshal votes. We've seen repeatedly over the last few years that Iran looks to the United Nations and its subsidiary bodies as a place to legitimize itself and its ambitions for regional and global leadership. Iran's Universal Periodic Review, held in February 2010, just nine months after the disputed presidential elections, was the first time in recent years that UN member states sat in judgment on Iran's human rights record. The UPR process, now in its first fourth year, subjects every UN member state to scrutiny when its turn arrives. Countries must make a presentation on their record and respond to recommendations from others. For its part, Iran stacked the speakers list with friends content to turn the process into a sham. We worked just as hard to ensure that every voice of praise was met with tones of condemnation. Iran rejected recommendations involving cooperation with UN monitors seeking to visit the country. Oddly, they accepted certain recommendations, such as ensuring the equality of women and girls, that they surely had no intention to implement and have subsequently failed to fulfill. Rather than approaching the UPR as a genuine opportunity to own up to its shortcomings, Tehran chose to deflect criticism and hide its record. Undaunted by the spectacle, last spring, Iran ran for a seat on the Human Rights Council and mobilized an aggressive worldwide campaign to line up votes. They asked the world to ignore the UN's stated criteria for membership on the Council, which calls for countries to take into account candidates' human rights records in deciding who to support. 
It thought that pressure and backroom deals would prevail over principle. But through a concerted campaign of member states and non-governmental organizations, Iran's campaign was thwarted. A large majority of member states made clear that they were unwilling to back Tehran in this farcical crusade, to the point where Ter Iran dropped out of the race several weeks before the vote, rather than face a humiliation. Soon thereafter, we united with a group of 56 member states at the Council to deliver a strong statement of condemnation for Iran's abuses at the one-year anniversary of the 2009 elections. The Iranian delegation attempted to block Norway from reading the statement, setting off a last-ditch floor fight. We won the battle, and Iran's antics only drew more attention to the statement. Just a few months later, Iran sought membership on the executive board of UN Women, a travesty in light of their egregious record of abuse of women's rights. We made every effort to prevent the UN from being discredited and stop Iran from winning undeserved prestige and influence. Sure enough, we got the message out and kept Iran from gaining a seat. So the UN has been a critical arena to show Tehran that its treatment of its own people, its low regard for human rights, and its pattern of abuses has consequences. While we can and do convey that message on our own, the UN allows us to make clear that Iran's poor human rights record is of grave concern not just to the US and Europe, but to the entire world. The Iranian activists and dissidents we speak to confirm the obvious. Tehran cares about what happens at the United Nations, but so do we. The case for a new mandate focused on Iran's human rights record is powerful. The June 2009 elections and ensuing crackdown warranted the Human Rights Council's condemnation, but did not get it. The US had at that time been elected to the council, but not yet joined. Since, since then, the situation has gotten worse. In recent weeks, even as Iran's president has made a show of denouncing the violence in Libya and applauding the protests in Egypt, in Tehran, security forces beat, detained, and in several cases killed peaceful protesters. A UN report released yesterday expressed that Se Secretary General Ban Ki-moon is, quote, deeply troubled by reports of increased executions, amputations, arbitrary arrest and detention, unfair trials, and possible torture and ill-treatment of human rights activists, lawyers, journalists, and, and, and opposition figures. The Secretary General said that he had raised the issue of constraints on human rights activists and the use of the death penalty with Mohammad Javad Larajani, Secretary General of the Iranian High Council for Human Rights, during talks in New York last November. Larajani, at a judicial debate in December, argued stoning should not be classified as a method of execution, but rather a method of punishment, which is actually more lenient because half the people survive. The UN quoted him as saying, Freedom of expression is under siege. The government has jammed foreign broadcasts and blocked internet sites. Journalists and exiles abroad are receiving death threats from Iranians demanding that they cease criticizing the regime. 28 journalists and nine bloggers are currently in prison. Following protests last month, at least three individuals were killed in clashes with security forces. For those who were arrested and are being detained, there have been credible reports of torture. The execution rate continues to rise and is now the highest per capita in the world. Credible estimates, estimates suggest that well over 80 people were killed just in the few, and were executed just in the first two months of this year, most of them ethnic minorities. At the same time, Baha'is and other religious groups continue to be subjected to arbitrary arrests, prosecutions, harsh, harsh sentences, and unsafe prison conditions. The government continues to target students in Iran's vibrant academic community. Students are denied entry into universities based on their political and religious views. Administrations at the universities have sometimes expelled those already enrolled. Professors have been dismissed or denied advancement based on their political views. Leaders of Iran's opposition, including presidential candidates, remain under house arrest and members of their family are being held without charge. And yet, the regime continues to deny responsibility for its actions. The government will point to its standing invitation to UN Special Rapporteurs and its supposed invitation to the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights to visit Iran as evidence of its cooperation with the international community. In practice, no UN mandate holder has been able to visit Iran since 2005. The extension of a one-time offer over a year ago to the High Commissioner for Human Rights was an empty and inadequate gesture, as Iran has been unwilling so far to meet the modest preconditions set for a visit. In, face of this, in the face of this defiance, the international community cannot back down. It's not enough to pass resolutions year after year calling attentions, attention to problems that remain unsolved. We need to move to the next level and mount the pressure for change. Despite the facts, regrettably, creating a new mandate to focus on Iran is not a sure thing. 
We've been told even by some allies that while they applaud what we've done at the Human Rights Council so far, going on, uh, after an Iran resolution is, is a step too far and we're bound to fail. The rationales that countries proffer for rejecting this mandate are many, but none stand up to scrutiny. Some countries argue that Iran should have a veto over whether or not this resolution should be passed. They maintain that UN action on country situations should occur only with the consent of the country concerned. Our position is that in a situation of grave human rights abuses, we are all concerned countries. Others argue that dialogue with Iran is the answer, and that passing a resolution could undercut the, undercut the quiet conversations on human rights now underway with the regime. While we appreciate the efforts of countries that have been able to influence the regime, those efforts have borne limited fruit and should not stand in the way of pressure when pressure is due. Others choose to believe that after years of defiance, Iran will suddenly now throw open its doors to thematic experts and to searching scrutiny from the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. If Iran is indeed now keen to cooperate with UN mechanisms, this new rapporteur will give them a chance to prove it. There's a case to be made that a resolution on Iran would be worth pursuing whether we could prevail or not, but we prefer to succeed. This effort is not about grandstanding or showdown, but about action on a practical step that we hope will lead to change over time. For this reason, we've worked methodically over the last few months to build a cross-regional coalition of countries supporting the creation of this mandate. Current co-sponsors hail from Europe, South America, Asia, and Africa. We've learned through experience that having participation from every region in the leadership of controversial resolutions helps build momentum and counter criticism. We've worked to build our case with embassies here in Washington, UN missions in Geneva and New York, and in capitals around the world. We've brought facts, charts, voting tables, reports, and history. But Tehran is hardly a passive target. They've sent a deputy foreign minister to lobby in Geneva and are approaching individual delegations at a relentless pace. In many countries, Iran can invoke trade relationships and other equities to exert persuasive influence. They also benefit from regional bloc dynamics that can result in large groups of countries voting in unison to defend their own. Finally, they'll play on the aversion many capitals have to country-specific resolutions, often motivated by fear that someday the spotlight may be turned on them. So we face a difficult battle with more twists and turns to come as the council session enters its final weeks. We recognize that even if we're successful, a rapporteur will not deliver overnight the changes we hope to see, and our work will not be done. We're not naive enough to think that this resolution or this mandate will be transformative in of itself. Achieving impact in human rights work is a long, complex process. No single report, statement, or individual will achieve the breakthrough we hope for. It's worth taking a moment to review what a rapporteur is and isn't. A rapporteur is a prominent independent expert empowered by the UN to carry out monitoring and reporting on an individual country situation. The rapporteur will carry the imprimatur of the entire international community and will deliver information and messages that will be difficult for Tehran to dismiss or counter, although we know they'll try. The rapporteur will report at least annually to both the General Assembly in New York and the Human Rights Council in Geneva. Strong rapporteurs take advantage of their bully pulpit to issue statements, highlight issues, and make proposals that drive international debate. Late last year, Ted Picone of the Brookings Institution published a comprehensive study of the work of UN Special Rapporteurs entitled Catalysts for Rights. He found that such mechanisms, quote, represent one of the most effective tools of the international human rights system and that, quote, they have a direct impact on elevating attention to important and sensitive human rights problems by government officials, non-governmental organizations, the media, and politicians. He also highlighted the vital role of special rapporteurs as a lifeline for civil society, amplifying their concerns and challenges on the world stage. Rapporteurs serve as key conduits for victims of human rights abuse and human rights defenders so that their suffer suffering does not occur in silence. By speaking the names of dissidents and prisoners, special rapporteurs can help save lives. We're grateful for the indispensable work of civil society in pushing forward this campaign, carrying out their own lobbying in UN centers and capitals globally, and forcing policymakers to recognize that the pressure on Tehran must continue. 
The role of civil society in advocating, informing, and holding all governments accountable, including my own, for our domestic records and for our work at the United Nations is vitally important. Even if a special rapporteur is established, we will need the help of civil society to assist in identifying the right person to take on the job. We'll need someone credible, committed, uncorruptible, and courageous. The UN will be open to nominations from states and from non-governmental non sources, and it will be incumbent on all of us to engage in the process and make sure the individual selected is up to the job. We'll also need to keep the pressure on to ensure that Tehran makes good on its commitment to cooperate and pays a price if it does not. Country visits are among the most powerful tools in the Special Rapporteur's arsenal, enabling them to contact defenders, enter into dialogues with governments, and imbue their statements and reports with first-hand knowledge. It's possible, even likely, that Iran will resist the visits of a Special Rapporteur and deny that person access to the country. We've seen this in North Korea, Burma, and elsewhere. If it happens, the Rapporteur will need to rely on witnesses outside the country to carry out their work. This person will need ingenuity, tenacity, and determination to carry forward their mandate, no matter how difficult and dangerous. As important as, important as this effort is, it's part of a broader strategy. We've recently announced sanctions against several individuals in Iran who have been credibly linked to egregious human rights abuses. We continue to support Iran's vibrant civil society and work to keep them linked with allies around the world. The drive to pass this resolution is among the US high, U.S.'s highest priorities in the current Human Rights Council session. It forms part of our effort to deliver on reform of the Human Rights Council session by session and resolution by resolution. Some people think this effort is a waste of our energy. They condemn our engagement because some member, UN member states are, to borrow a term, bullies, thugs, and dictators. To address those concerns, I want to spend just a few minutes putting this effort on Iran into the wider context of our engagement at the UN Human Rights Council over the last 18 months. While we hold the UN to its founding ideals of peace, security, and individual freedom, the UN is a product of its 192 member states. Coalescing support around the cause of human rights is not easy. The challenges relate far less to the UN and its sometimes sclerotic rules, routines, and procedures, as frustrating as they are, than they do to the membership and its divergent motives and viewpoints. When we read with disgust the praise Libya garnered during its universal periodic review process, the problem is not the process itself, but rather the member states that chose to pander, soft pedal, and deny the truth. When we're displeased with the UN's performance, it's usually because we're dissatisfied with the countries around us. To criticize the UN is to chide the community of nations. Not that we shouldn't call out the UN for its failings, and we often do, but when we're frustrated, we should know and understand what's standing in our way. Day in and day out, we take our seat at the Council to confront adversaries across the UN system and build common cause with allies. We know the consequences of disengaging. If we cede leadership at the United Nations, other states will rush in to fill that vacuum, and they will not act in our interest. We saw that happen in 20, 2002 on Iran, and we don't want to let it happen again. Choosing to pursue this resolution doesn't mean we're blind to the limitations of the UN Human Rights Council or that we think we can miraculously transform it. Let's face it, while suspending Libya's membership at the Council was an important step a few weeks ago, Libya should never have been there in the first place. Some countries seek membership on the Council not to advance the cause of human rights, but to thwart it to shield their friends from scrutiny and hold back the development of norms. Since taking our seat, we've sought to rally the membership in a different direction, to address a wider array of serious human rights situations around the world. Even some council advocates had given up on the idea that the body would ever effectively address divisive country situations. They urged us to focus instead on thematic issues that were less likely to threaten member states. But in our view, the international human rights system will be judged first and foremost by what it does in response to the most serious situations of human rights abuse within countries. So we've worked steadily to build the docket of Human Rights Council country work and expect to see nearly a half dozen new country resolutions during the current session now underway. While the roster is now expanding rather than contracting, the Council still devotes far too much attention to the Israeli-Palestinian issue, the subject of a standalone agenda item, whereas every other human rights situation in the world is dealt with under common items. 
Despite these problems, we're clear in our reasoning for joining the Council. President Obama and Secretary Clinton believe human rights matters and that we can accomplish more working from within than standing outside as a critic. Secretary of State Clinton traveled to Geneva two weeks ago to address the high-level session of the Human Rights Council. Her presence underscored the fact that this resolution on Iran comes at an important time and that it will be seen through the lens of the international community's commitment to human rights in the wider region. I was proud to join her behind the U.S. placard, and I'll leave you with her words in describing the effort to achieve a special rapporteur on Iran. This will be a seminal moment for this council and a test of our ability to work together to advance the goals that it represents. Indeed, every member of this council should ask him or herself a simple question. Why do people have the right to live free from fear in Tripoli but not Tehran? The denial of human dignity in Iran is an outrage that deserves the condemnation of all who speak out for freedom and justice. Victory on the creation of a special rapporteur is only one step. If we're successful, it'll be up to all of us to ensure that this new mandate is not only a turning point for the Human Rights Council, but also a real and concrete step to improve the human rights situation for millions of people within Iran. Thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Ali Scotton from Booz Allen Hamilton's Persia House. Uh, as you mentioned, the United States recently passed or enacted um, travel and uh, financial sanctions on human rights abusers in Iran, which was seen as a step forward by many. Uh, the only, there are limitations though. For instance, I don't know any Revolutionary Guards commanders that were planning on visiting Disneyland anytime soon. So my question is, what um, efforts is the State Department making to pressure countries in Europe as well as other places like Turkey and Dubai uh, to enact certain uh, similar sanctions? And it's part of a very robust conversation that we now have with our allies uh, about the broad strategy to address the situation in Iran and all of the tactics and tools. And uh, I think there's a lot of common ground, uh, a wide sense that we need to do more. I think the resolution has helped to sort of jumpstart that debate and conversation. It's something that we're very uh, actively pursuing. Same with the Democracy Coalition Project. Thanks so much, um, Suzanne. I first want to applaud uh, the U.S. government for its leadership at the Human Rights Council on this issue. Um, an issue that DCP has been focused on, um, and also applaud you for the incredible work that you've been doing in, in changing the dynamics on the Human Rights Council, uh, in particular the outcome of the special session on Libya, the suspension of Libya um, from the Human Rights Council, and we hope um, um, this trend will continue. Um, my question um, is with regard to the special rapporteur that's going to be established. Um, Will this rapporteur be able to report on violations in the past, I mean, since 2009, or is it now forward-looking? Thanks. It is forward-looking, but to the extent that uh, abuses that the rapporteur is documenting relate to historical events, to legislation passed, to measures taken, uh, you know, there's an opportunity to put it in context, and in practice, the good rapporteurs interpret their, their mandates broadly, uh, and so they can, they do link together periods of events, and you know, I think not, uh, try not to look at you know, what they're seeing right in front of them in isolation. So I think we can be hopeful that there'll be kind of a wider context and a wider lens, but it is technically, it will be a mandate that's forward going from the time that it's established. Suzanne, thank you. I want to echo the sentiments of uh, expressing gratefulness that the administration has really elevated this issue uh, of human rights. I think during the conference earlier today, some of the viewpoints that were expressed uh, indicated that there was some frustration that the approach thus far had been very much focused on uh, the nuclear issue and there is a need for a greater balance. What I wanted to ask is, are we seeing a shift? in which the approach going forward is going to have a much stronger component of human rights in a sustainable fashion that is going to really become a cornerstone of the policy. And if so, will it also then entail addressing uh, some of the effects that also was brought up during the conference that some U.S. sanctions have had in the sense of creating problems for the opposition to be able to communicate outside. There seems to be some opportunities for quick fixes that would enable uh, lifting some of the sanctions that have inhibited um, uh, communication, etc., which is so critical for the pro-democracy movement. Thank you. Um, 
You know, I think our policy is multifaceted, and it will continue to uh, be so. So I wouldn't put any one dimension, uh, you know, ahead or behind or, or to the exclusion of others. But uh, I do, I will say, it's clear we're very focused and committed to uh, making progress on the human rights situation and putting political capital on the line to do so, uh, it's an effort that the White House is engaged in, that many people across the State Department are engaged in, and uh, we've seen a really high level of commitment to this. Um, and I, I think that will be sustained. I think everybody does recognize that the Special Rapporteur, while important, uh, is no panacea, and that we're going to need to continue to work to look for new means and mechanisms to spotlight the issues uh, and keep the pressure up. You know, as far as uh, the kinds of concerns that you're raising, uh, you know, of course we have an interest in ensuring uh, freedom of expression, uh, that people are able to associate, to assemble, uh, to articulate their views. And so that, you know, concerns in terms of how other policies are interfering with that or affecting that, you know, something that we would certainly take seriously uh, and look at. Thank you. I'm Victoria Woodbury with Senator Menendez. I wanted to ask about, um, it has been an, a problem in the Human Rights Council, accountability and enforcement, even after a special rapporteur has made his or her recommendations. And you mentioned the importance of making sure that Iran will pay a price if it doesn't cooperate with just letting the rapporteur in. What would that look like and what, what has been discussed as what, what can be put forth? It's a good question. You know, uh, I mean, I think we are seeing uh, some greater focus on the Human Rights Council on tangible steps to uh, influence accountability. We established, as part of the emergency special session that was convened on Libya, a commission of inquiry, and that commission has already been constituted and is starting to go about their work. So that's good. I mean, that's actually something action-oriented that the council did rather quickly. We're now uh, you know, having a discussion about a potential commission of inquiry for Cote d'Ivoire, which uh, similarly is a warranted next step to continue to put the pressure on in, in a grave situation that was the subject of an emergency session back in December. But you know, we really need to look at every stage, at kind of what, you know, what measures we've taken, and then how well they're working, and what we can do next. And I think over time, also kind of how we can expand the toolbox, because uh, it's not as broad ranging as we might want it to be. This is something we've talked about at the council about doing, you know, what are additional things that can be done uh, with the office of the high commissioner uh, and with other kinds of steps. But I think we'll have to look at the situation and see what the access issues are and, and what might have an effect uh, at ameliorating them. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Secretary, for the remarks you made. I uh, teach, uh, I'm from Webster University, Hossein Shabazi, and uh, I want you to help me to explain to my students when they ask me, uh, actually I had that question just uh, last week, when they ask me that, uh, how, do you, how, how do you explain when uh, the American government, the US government, uh, veto down uh, the settlement uh, resolution, uh, which is, you know, of course, you know, uh, violation of human rights, and then uh, it so aggressively and correctly and rightly goes after Iran uh, with a special rapporteur, as you mentioned. I try to say that there are two different things, and I try to defend the policy that, you know, well, you know, it's just something is more uh, concrete than some other ones. Just trying to, all my means to explain the way, but it doesn't sit well with them. So I want you to explain uh, not only, I mean, help me to understand, but also I read somewhere that uh, some of your colleagues from Europe are also not coming on board because of the very fact that they feel this, you know, double standard again that America or the U.S. government is playing. So I would appreciate your comments. Sure, thank you. You know, in this case for Iran, Iran has been the subject of a very strong General Assembly resolution now for many years uh, that passes with large and growing 
majority of votes. So this gap that I talked about in not having this dedicated rapporteur, I think does make sense to a lot of delegations as a necessary next step. And I think that's why we, working with others, have been able to make the case for it. Um, on Israel, as you know, and as we said at the time uh, when we vetoed that resolution, our concern was really that passage of that resolution and action in the UN Security Council was not going to advance the cause of a sustainable uh, direct talks and, and peace between the parties, that it actually uh, would risk setting that cause back. We also, when we get to the Human Rights Council and the many Israel-related resolutions that pass there, as I mentioned, we, we have a, a structural anomaly at the Council. We have a standalone, dedicated, single agenda item just uh, devoted to Israel, whereas every other country in the world, good, bad, uh, you know, I think it's 191 of them, are dealt with together uh, under, under two other items. So there is a structural anomaly in the Council, and that makes it difficult to try to look at the issues in uh, the way that one should, through, in a balanced way that treats all countries equally. So the history of the UN's treatment of Israel is a difficult one, and I think we still struggle with it. And it makes it uh, you know, tough, certainly, for us to uh, look at these resolutions uh, you know, in a positive light and to look at them as efforts that are aimed at actually generating human rights improvement on the ground uh, as opposed to other motives. So that's, that's you know, really, I know we, you know, it's an issue that, uh, uh, you know, we're not going to agree on uh, with everybody, but that is, that's how we see it. Um, my question is also about a double standard, but a completely different one. Um, over the past uh, few weeks to a couple months, we've seen the Iranian government expend uh, considerable effort to um, uh, highlight uh, or, or oppose or condemn the use of uh, repression against uh, the people in Egypt and in Libya and uh, Tunisia and most recently, of course, in Bahrain. Um, and yet, uh, as this condemnation from the Iranian government through their various uh, uh, kind of press organs uh, rings hollow to us and to the people of Iran and to the people of the Middle East, um, there's still a sense that this kind of uh, obvious hypocrisy or um, kind of delegitimized kind of discourse by the government is, is not um, kind of utilized effectively by us um, uh, in the West in dealing um, uh, with the Iranian government. Do you feel or is the State Department um, taking um, uh, or considering more effective or active kind of messaging efforts to delegitimize literally the rhetoric of, uh, of the government of Iran in, in, in light of the fact that it does enjoy considerable soft power in the Middle East? Is there a way to more effectively utilize um, that, that double standard issue and kind of use it as an attack prong rather than being defensive about it? And yeah, I think we're always on the lookout for more effective ways to make these points, to call, call those issues out. Uh, you know, I think the, this effort on the special rapporteur, you know, is a piece of it to say, you know, amidst this very complex and fast-moving situation, you know, here is uh, a government, uh, you know, whose record and conduct is clear, and we need to take action on it, and it can't be delayed. Um, so, I, you know, that's one piece, but... You know, I, I'm not sure exactly what you have in mind about how we could do it uh, more effectively, but I'm sure there would be interest in, uh, you know, hearing out all ideas about how to how to how to get these messages across. 